Hi ladies, I hope you are well. I'm sure you must be really, really extremely busy right now finalizing projects, preparing for exams. But despite the busyness, we can still devote time for the Lord, make time for the Lord uh, in prayer, in reading the Bible, and also studying the Bible. So today we're going to uh, do a Bible study mainly from Romans chapter 8, verse 35 to 39. But just to have a concept or kind of... Uh, help us situate here what we're talking about we're going to start from verse 28 the title of today's bible study is forgiven much loves much and we're going to look at it through the apostle paul's perspective and we know that for those who love god all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose for those whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, and who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, For your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through, through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither, life, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of, Christ, from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, in this passage, Paul is making just a statement of, you know, the great things that as children of God, the great privileges as children of God that we receive, that we have. For example, he says, uh, if we start at the beginning, he said that we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. So here he's specifically talking about um, those who are born again and the great privileges that we have. For example, at verse 32, he says... Um, will God not also graciously give us all things? You know, nobody can bring a charge against the children of God and Christ is interceding for us. And he's saying all these great things about the privileges, like I say, that we have as children of God. We have power, we have authority. And towards the end of this passage, Paul makes such a bold statement and he says, Therefore, you know, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? You know, neither tribulations, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword, you know, name it. Nothing can separate us from Christ because of, you know, because of all of this, nothing can separate us from Christ. Now, in my early days, uh, early years, I would say, of being born again, I, when I read this passage, I, this is how I understood it. I understood it that... Paul was saying, nothing can separate God from his love for us. Because it's only understandable that, you know, nothing can separate the Father for his love, from his love for us. Because he's God, you know, no nakedness, no tribulation, no high to death, no angels, death, life. Nothing can separate God from loving us. His love is always there. His love is always permanent. But... Recently, you know, reading this verse, I understood that Paul is not saying nothing can separate God. He's saying nothing can separate us. I don't know if you see that, but that's a bold statement. I mean, it's like someone who says, I'm going to love God no matter what. You know, nakedness, you can come, sword, persecute me, torture me, you know, skin me in life. Anything you want to do, nothing. I will never, ever stop loving God. Now... I don't know, but the only thing I know is to err is human. As human beings, you know, we t sometimes we tend to make, you know, these pledges and this commitment and then we fail. You know, sometimes we say, oh, I'll do this or I promise I will do this. I promise I will love you. You know, how many people, you know, at the altar, they say, oh, 
till death do us apart you know the couples when they get married they say to death do us apart or they say you know I will love you through sickness and health and whatever whatever and then when they come into the marriage ground and they realize all the intensity then they separate they divorce even King Solomon himself he has a wise word to say about this if you look at Ecclesiastes um, chapter 5 verse 2 it says be not rash with your mouth nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God for God is in heaven and you are on earth therefore let your words be few uh, Solomon is saying do not be do not be hasty in your words when you come into the presence of God don't just you know be like a foolish person and say oh God I'm willing to do it then I was wondering why would Paul make su make such a bold statement did he mean every single word he said or is he just exaggerating you know Oh, I'm writing this letter. I just want to make myself, you know, look good to this romance and I'll just say whatever I have to say. But what was Paul thinking about? So that's what we have, we'll be looking at today. I want to invite us to read Luke chapter 7. We're going to start from verse 36. And in Luke th uh, chapter 7, it's talking about a sinful, uh, the sinful woman. So it says, one of the Pharisees asked him, so him here is Christ. So one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And when he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table, and behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, she, when she learned that, she was, that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment and standing behind him at his feet weeping she began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the anointment now when the pharisees who had invited him saw this he said to himself if this man were a prophet he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him for she is a sinner and when jesus and Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say, teacher, a certain money lender had two debtors, one owed 5,000 denarii, denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, The one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet, my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, for her, her sins, which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the tab at table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sin? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. In peace. Now let's understand the story here. We have a sinful a woman who knows that Jesus is at a certain place and she's just loaded with sin and she comes to she enters the house and she's just overwhelmed she's had an experience with Christ she knows that this is the Son of God this is the Messiah so she just knows that this man is so good that this man is the Son of God and the only what can I even do to show my gratitude because this guy this man who is in front of me is great so what she begins to do she's just weeping weeping out of uh, you know overwhelming the overwhelming emotions and she's just weeping weeping and we see here that her tears are wetting Jesus's feet and then she takes the ointment and she starts to just anoint his feet now the people around were like oh why are you doing this you know this you're a sinner you shouldn't touch jesus's feet but jesus gives an example he say if you have two people who are owing someone money the first one owes 500 the second one just 50 and when the debtor says okay i've canceled your debts who would be more grateful it's the person who owes more money 
And it makes sense that a person who owed more money would be more grateful than the person who just owed 50. And that's what he's trying, that's what Jesus is trying to say here. The reason why this lady is kissing my feet, she's wetting my feet, and she's anointing my feet is because she understands her sinful nature. And she's just overwhelmed by the fact that I will forgive her sin or that she has experienced me in the past. She is overwhelmed. You Pharisees don't even see that because you think you are righteous in your own eyes. And let's go back to the story of Paul. Before Paul began, uh, became born again, he persecuted the church. He imprisoned Christians. He approved the murder of many Christians. Paul was a murderer. Paul did atrocious, uh, atrocious things that we don't even know of. He was the bad guy. Now look at someone like that who had no interest in Christ when Christ visited him on his way to Damascus and he says, Paul, I want to use you. I want to use you for my kingdom. I mean, look at that. I mean, out of all the people that Jesus could have shown himself to, why would he show himself to a persecutor of the church? Why would he show himself to someone who was persecuting him? And being exposed to that vision that Paul had. And if we go back to Romans 8 and we see all the privileges that we have as children of God. I mean, look at me. You know, if we're Paul, you know, look at me. I was a former murderer. I was a former persecutor of the church. But now today, God has given me his Holy Spirit. His son is interceding for me. He gave me, he graciously gave me everything. I have gifts, I can heal, I, I can perform miracles. I'm even doing more than the, 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 the original apostles. And if we look at the Bible, most of the letters in the New Testament the majority of the letters are written by Paul and he's doing a lot for the kingdom of God. And for someone like that, he's like, what did I do to deserve this God? Like, what did I do? For someone who's so overwhelmed by the magnitude of God's love and grace, it's no wonder that he can say, Father, I don't even know how to repay what you did. The only thing that I can do is to show my love for you. If we even can go back to verse 36, I mean, verse, verse 36 says, For your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. And he and Paul, if we all know the life of Paul, how when he became Christian, he was persecuted. Now he was the one being persecuted. You know, people would beat him, they would flog him, and so many things, so many torture he went through for the sake of Christ. Not once in his letters, not once in the book of Acts of Apostles do we see Paul saying to God, God, I'm tired. What is this? You know, I deserve better. I'm so Serving you, I'm going to all these places to preach your word. How can you allow this? No, the only thing we see is the heart of contentment, being satisfied, being submissive, and that's what happened. So from these passages, we understand that those who have been forgiven much, as a result, they love God much. The sinful woman was forgiven much. And Paul was forgiven much. That's why they love God much. And that's why Jesus says in Luke 7, at the, towards the end, it's, he says, Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And the reason why today some of us, we are not willing to suffer, we complain, we grumble, and we're not happy with the way things are going. And we're always saying, God, why are you doing this? God, why is this happening to me? Oh God, you have to bless me. Because we think that God owes us. I mean, some of us were not murderers. Some of us did not persecute the church. Some of us did not imprison, imprison Christians. So we think that, you know, prior to becoming born again, we didn't do bad things. So why should we feel, you know, guilty? Or why should we feel like, oh, we were so, you know, big sinners so that God, you know, forgave us much. We feel like, you know, my past life, yes, I made my mistakes, but I wasn't that bad. And... Consequently, when we come to the Lord, we feel like 
God owes us because of all the things we do for him. I mean, we serve God, we sacrifice a lot for him, we're there, you know, trying to do our best to be better, good Christians. So God owes us, God must bless us, God must not allow these things to, things to happen the way they're happening right now. God should not allow this and that in our lives because he owes us. But that's not it, ladies. That's not it. Whatever our past life was, sin is still sin. If it was just for one sin that we had committed, Jesus would still come and die on the cross for us. Because just one sin, no matter how big or small it may look in our eye, just one sin separates us from God. Just one sin. So only when we come face to face with the gravity of sin, only when we understand how God takes sin seriously, that indeed we can recognize, oh, I'm nothing before God. I shouldn't try to exalt myself before God. I mean, this is what Paul and this, this sinful woman, they understood. Only then we can say, whatever will God has for me, I'm willing to submit. Of course, it's not easy sometimes to submit to God's will, to God's plan, to His decisions. But when we understand that this is the Father who saved me from my wretchedness, from my wretchedness who saved me from the pit that I was in, who saved me and delivered me and clean and cleansed me and gave he and gave me his holy spirit when we understand the great things that God has given us despite the fact that we were not worthy ladies that's the only time we can say lord i'm done what do you want me to do what can i do and it's sad that this attitude is still not in us yet because we're still trying to show ourselves great to God. God, you should be grateful. God, you should be, you should give me this. You should bless me. You should do this for me and do that for me. No, that's not the attitude we should have when we're dealing when, when we have this relationship with our Father. We're nothing without God. We're nothing without His grace. We're nothing without His love. And He graciously gave us all things in Christ he loved us so much and only a grateful heart can see what Paul said and I pray that one day we'll all come to this point where we can say confidently for I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor death nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Stay blessed ladies.